Okay, good morning, everybody. Today is Wednesday, December 23rd, 2020. Hope everyone's having a good day. Um, what's nice about today's news is that there's nothing substantially crazy to report. And I mean, listen, everything in the world right now is crazy. So when there's something a little less crazy, it kind of seems a bit sane instead for a change, right? But anyways, let's get into it. Now, let's start off with something a little more, I guess we could say fun. It's been rumored and at this point pretty much confirmed because I think Apple hasn't done a good job of plugging the leaks and things like that of their upcoming products the way that Steve Jobs did. But it's pretty much been confirmed that in the next two to four years, Apple's going to be coming out with their own self-driving car. Now, Google did that five, six years ago. It kind of flopped, didn't work. And Google also did the Google Glass thing, kind of flopped too. So I think Apple took note of that. And I think Apple realizes that timing is everything. But the point I want to mention here is that Elon Musk came out and tweeted pretty much saying... He implied essentially that he was going to take this to the, to his grave with him, but now that Apple is going to be a competitor down the road, he said when Tesla's Model 3 program was not doing well, he approached Tim Cook a handful of years ago to take a meeting, not to ask for some type of merger or just to see what could come of it. That's all. Tim Cook didn't take the meeting. Now, look, I got a lot of respect for Tim Cook as a, as a CEO. I think that with respects to running a corporation – he does a good job, but I could tell you he's no Steve Jobs. Now, don't get me wrong. You might, I might get trashed on for saying that when everyone, people might say, Dave, how could you say that? You know, he's worth hundreds of millions. You know, he's way better off than us. Yeah, but let's be honest here, guys. He's running the company well. We can't deny that, right? Whether you like him or not is a different story, and that's not for me to judge or say. But anyways, the next thing I want to talk about too is, well, one last thing I wanted to mention. Steve Jobs would have taken that meeting. If Steve Jobs was alive, he would have guaranteed taken that meeting. And it's easy. It's easier said than done. I know it's easy to look back and say, well, if we had just done this, we could have been billionaires by now. I know that. I know that. But it's not like Tim Cook had the meeting and turned it down and said, you know, respectfully, I, I don't think this is the right time for Apple, whatever. He didn't even take the meeting. Like, part of my English, what the fuck is that? The thing I like about Steve Jobs, whether people think he was an innovator or he just stole ideas, whether or not you think whatever you think of Steve Jobs what i liked about the guy was that he always said the best ideas have to win he always said that if the janitor of his company at apple if one of the janitors had a better idea than one of the top executives they're going with the janitor's ideas and he said he goes healthy arguments are great or healthy debates about which idea is better moving forward for any type of product in any type of company because the best ideas have to win if and it's true if the best ideas don't win then ego and pride and greed get in the way and then you have situations like for example rim blackberry they were huge 10 years ago but then they lost focus they stopped taking ideas from people that were less superior than the high ranking executives and look what happened the executives were too busy trying to buy a hockey team or whatever. Anyways, I mean, I'm not trying to shit on BlackBerry and Rim, but you know what I mean. They're still around, but they're not like they were before. Let's face it. They've tried to kind of focus more towards a, a corporate style a system instead of trying to take a, a piece of the consumer smartphone market. Now, the next thing I want to mention is that is this new COVID bill. So there's a few things about that. Trump, whether you like it or not, and whether you like Trump or not, Trump pretty much said last night he won't accept the bill that has a one-time $600 payment to all Americans. He pretty much says he wants minimum $2,000 payment or else he's not going to accept it. And both sides, Republicans and Democrats, are like, yeah, let's do it. So I don't think there's anything really bad to report about that, guys. I mean, whether you hate the guy or not, let's, and whether he's doing this for himself to look good as he's on his way out or not, hey, look, it's great. Who wouldn't want free money, essentially, right? I mean, many other countries have been doing it, and so I've been waiting for months to see when the next stimulus package was going to come, right? And so if I'm not mistaken, I think the last time Americans received any type of stimulus money from the federal government was March or April, if I'm not mistaken. Now, the next thing about that bill is that there's a lot of different things going on because it's a five or 6,000 page bill, but not like, you know, the little pages in a novel, full on, you know, regular standard size paper pages. They were given this bill, both Republicans and Democrats, to vote on, but they only had two to three hours to read this bill, which, again, is a strategy of the corporations, the big oil, big pharma, the military industrial complex, because these guys lobby and give money to both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats. 
So what do they do? Okay, listen, we're going to give $600 to the American people, but there's a whole bunch of stuff in there too. There's like another $700 billion for the military. Yeah, just push that through there too. And yeah, no, we're going to put it out in around 1 p.m. You guys got to vote on it for 5 p.m. So even if you get your whole team on it, you can't read through the whole thing. So yeah, let's just vote it through. And the Republicans and the Democrats, whether you like them or not, they're given no choice but to say, yeah, let's do it because they want American people to get money. Even though in that bill, there's millions going to literally like horse racers. There's millions of dollars going to horse racers. I'm not even kidding. There's also millions going to Pakistan. And people are complaining, saying, you know, the United States gives foreign aid. Yeah, and they're kind of obligated to certain deals and contracts they made. But in a time like this, when every other country is taking care of their own, why is the U.S. still sending money overseas? Now, again... I understand, like when you take a look at, for example, $500 million in this bill is going to Israel's air defense system. Now, here's the thing about this. I would say this is not the time to be sending money, but we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. But at the same time, the $500 million is actually nothing new. So just to clarify that before anyone says, well, Dave, what are you talking about? The $500 million that was put through in this bill to go to Israel's air defense system was part of a $32 billion deal that Obama signed with Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu, back in, I believe, late 2015, early 2016, if I'm not mistaken. So the deal was $32 billion over the course of 10 years, and every time some type of bill or stimulus package went through, they would give a, a, a dripple of that money to Israel until it reached the full $32 billion by the end of the 10 years. So, fine. You know what I mean? I, I guess I understand what people say when they say that why is Israel getting money when Americans are getting way less, but they have no problem giving half a billion dollars to Israel's air defense system. I get it. I get it. I really do. But at the same time, it's the way politics works, and I know that that's not an answer, that's not an excuse. But unless the system is revamped from the ground up, this is what we're dealing with, unfortunately. And at the end of the day, what's nice is that people essentially push institutions and agencies to do what they want, but they need to keep us divided because they know, and not to get too conspiratorial, but they understand that in order to maintain a legitimately looking democracy and not some type of dictatorship or fascism or some type of the sort, they need to listen to the people when the people speak up, right? And which is why they're so happy this divisiveness, divisiveness excuse me, is happening right now. Now, you might say, Dave, who do you mean they when you say they? The elites, the global establishment, certain factions of the military-industrial complex, the big oil, the big pharma, all those guys, right? And I, I say that because I don't like when people say they and then they don't explain who they is. So, anyways... The next thing I wanted to mention quickly is that COVID-19 has reached and made its way to a research facility in Antarctica. The only way I could see that it traveling in that sense, the virus, is if someone flew in, part of the research team, that maybe tested negative but still was able to transmit. I, I don't know. Honestly, guys, there's so much disinformation and real information that's trying to be suppressed by the mainstream media. I, I don't know what's true and what's not true, and I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I do. So, again, if you guys want to chime in on that, I would appreciate it. The next thing is that Trump's personal banker who at Deutsche Bank, who was designated to handle all of his businesses, because when, when you're a billionaire or you're worth hundreds of millions, literally it gets to the point where the bank values you so much that they assign like a one or two or a small team of people to handle your personal banking at all hours of the day. So... This was even before Trump ran, but this gentleman who's been handling his business for years stepped down and resigned. Not sure why, but we'll see what happens. Who knows what's going on behind the scenes? Who knows what's happening? The next thing is that Biden claims that the Pentagon is not briefing his team on the alleged Russian cyber attack. Here's the problem I have with this. I don't know if Biden is actually telling the truth in that sense. I don't know if it's part of a puppet show, but the last thing you would want, I don't care if Trump is going to, you want everyone to unite and all that. And I, I do, but it, not in this situation. It's not the time right now in the sense that if you're complaining, this is only telling our adversaries and enemies overseas of the West that things are unstable. Now, unless there's some type of form of psychological warfare in the sense that there's a deceitful proposition at hand, that's a little bit different because maybe Biden was told to say this when in reality, everything's fine and he's being briefed. We don't know what's going on. Now, allegedly, the Pentagon is taking a lot of heat, too, because Trump is trying to push allegedly a military coup, which he denied. He said in a meeting, and I don't want to get into that just because it's just pointless gossip. It's just who said this, who said that. So I'm not going to, you know what I mean, guys? Like, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, well, this, this, whatever, right? So Anyways, the next thing is that the Department of Justice is suing Walmart, saying that Walmart has contributed to the opioid crisis for years through the use of their pharmaceutical branches. 
okay, this is interesting because big pharma has been in the pockets of Republicans and Democrats for years, even independents, let's face it. But what's interesting here is that the Department of Justice is doing this as Trump is on his way out. Now, what I find interesting is that not just Trump, but if you look at former presidential administrations, the administration's legal team teams would always pardon people, which is traditional, near the end of their term, and would always go after people they said they were going to go after at the beginning of their term, which they never did. So when they do it at the end, at least when they get out of office, they could say, well, we tried, we tried to go after them, we tried to go after the pharmaceuticals companies. It's just a show. The way I see it is just a show. The DOJ is, the Department of Justice is suing Walmart. All Walmart has to say, assuming I know all the angles here, in a negotiation room is pretty much, listen, lessen the load of the lawsuit or drop the lawsuit entirely, or we're taking all of our employees and we're going overseas. What the hell are you going to do about it? And maybe I'm missing a lot of different things, and maybe you guys can help me fill out some things on that situation. But again, that's the way I see it. That's how the corporations dangle things over the head of, the, of these politicians. Very simple. And the politicians know this because whether they accept $1,000 or a, a $1 million donation from these corporations, they're still accepting money in exchange for some favor, whether it's a lessened sentence or a lessened um, repercussion or something like that. The next thing is that Karl Rove, former advisor to George, a, uh, George W. Bush in the early to mid-2000s, called Michael Flynn a nut job. something I honestly never thought I would see because Karl Rove is always on Fox News. He's a very avid contributor to Fox News, very right-leaning. For him to call Michael Flynn a nut job, it, whether you're for Trump or not, it tells me something about Michael Flynn, I guess, but... What I also have to do is I also have to look at the other angle here. We have to look at the other angle. And we have to say, how did Michael Flynn become such a respected general if he's such a bad person? At least how did he become a respected general and a three or four star general before Trump, you know, he got involved with Trump? How is he such a bad person? I don't understand. Does he have shady ties to Russia? Possibly. But what, Biden doesn't have shady ties to China? I don't know. That, that's all I'm saying. Now... Allegedly, the doctors in the UK will be receiving anywhere from 10 to 20,000 pounds per month, which is the equivalent of, I think, like 25 or 30,000 USD dollars, if they, if, uh, they endorse the va people taking the vaccine. Now, here's the thing. I will tell you guys, it's very hard to substantiate that, but that's the word that's going around right now. At the same time, a rumor like this was going around in the United States six or seven months ago, alleging that hospitals were making money and getting paid every time they checked off the box that they had another COVID patient. I'm not sure about that. Elon Musk claimed that to be the case on Joe Rogan's podcast, as well as many other politicians from the left and the right, mainly the right though. But the thing is, is because it's unsubstantiated, other than the people who are just claiming it, it's hard to say. Excuse me, I just needed a drink of water there. Now, Trump also announced a boatload of pardons last night. Look, wh whichever way you splice it, a pardon is a pardon. I don't think it's worth it to just sit and, and I guess we could call dilly-dally on the people he pardoned. Look, guys, whether you like him or not, he's going to pardon who we pardon and we got to let it go. More things to focus on. We got to move on, right? So, the next, one of the final things that I want to talk about as well is... Israel's new unity government party has collapsed seven months after it formed, which means that there will be a fourth general election in a, sh in a short period of time, I think two or three years. This is another thing that I want to say, too, is similar to Trump's pardons. Look, let the, I know that the West is very heavily influenced and tied in with Israel very well, and I, I, I support Israel in many different ways, but at the same time, Excuse me. What's going on in their country is their own affairs. Now, look, if, if the, the elites in Washington and the career politicians have deep vested interests overseas to make sure that the U.S. still dominates other countries. Look, the way I see it, guys, that's their problem, because I got I personally and I can I'm, I'm happy to debate this, but I personally agree with Trump on one thing, which is that we got to get out of these pointless wars. We do. And people on the left are even saying, yeah, he's right. We've got to get rid of these pointless wars. It, 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 it's pointless. Does it make money for the military-industrial complex? Yeah. But those guys don't need that kind of money. They really don't. But again, what are they going to do? All they keep doing is asking for more money from Congress. And then all they do is take some of that money, recycle it back into Congress when they bribe them or lobby them, as they call them. Which there's a debate as to whether or not lobbying should be legal or not in the United States. That's another discussion or debate in and of itself. But 
it's just the same thing. So if Congress passes, you know, a $1 trillion bill, it goes to the mill. They issue, you know, some of that money is uh, within that trillion dollars, for example, would go to defense contracts. Then what do those companies do? They take, you know, two or three percent of the money they made there and they dump it back into Republican donations and Democrat donations. It's very simple. So that's it for today, guys. I, maybe I did miss a couple things, but nothing dramatic enough that I missed out on some kind of reporting unless something comes out after I recorded this. But again, that's just the way it goes. So thank you so much for getting your news from me today and from this show and this channel. And we will see you later this afternoon for the regularly scheduled uh, traditional uh, episode. Thank you guys so much.